Bloomberg is now on your dashboard. With Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, it gives you access to every Bloomberg podcast, live audio feeds from Bloomberg Radio, print stories from Bloomberg News in audio form, and the latest headlines at the click of a button with Bloomberg News Now. It's free with the latest version of the Bloomberg Business app. That's the Bloomberg Business app. Get it on your phone in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. Just download the app, connect your phone to your car, and get started. And it's all presented by our sponsor, Interactive Brokers. Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. It is, I guess, kind of M&A Tuesday, Jess. Choice right. Hotels launches a hostile bid for Wyndham. Um, you don't see this very often, so right. you got an exchange offer going. I don't know what's going right. on. Right, the Wall here. Street Journal putting out the story. Yep, Jody Laurie, she uh, joins. She's a credit analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Jody, can you explain what's happening here with Choice Hotels and Wyndham? Sure, Paul. So I think the choice situation is one of the more interesting ones that we've been following. Uh, just as a quick recap, since the spring, Choice has been trying to court Wyndham into merging, and Wyndham has said no multiple times. October 17th, they made it public, and Wyndham said absolutely not. And now they're they're doing the 1980s style hostile takeover. Nice. They're doing, you know, they're they're asking shareholders to feel free to exchange and and get some cash or get stock for the new company, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> if you look at Wyndham stock ticker symbol WH here, it's just down about five tenths of a percent, up about eleven percent year to date. Though, walk us through the thought process of shareholders right now. I mean, I think shareholders have to decide really what, at the end of the day, they want to get out of it. You know, if they think this is a good exit point, they'll they'll do it. If they really think that it's something that they, they'd rather just continue staying with Wyndham, they will. I mean, from the bondholders' perspective, the key is that for choice, it's definitely a much less savory situation for bondholders because obviously they're going to take on debt in order to finance this. So they don't have enough cash on the balance sheet, nor do they generate enough cash flow to be able to pay for this. I mean, we're talking four or five could up could be up to seven or eight billion dollars if you know in theory if the whole entire offer gets accepted you know and, and they need to pay it in cash um i don't think it would get to that point we've been saying about four billion dollars and and we're talking about six times leverage at least wow that's higher than i'm sure you would like and a lot of the bondholders would like um <laughs> what's this what's the rationale for wyndham rebuffing choice hotels here so I think for, for Wyndham, it's a less slam dunk of a situation, not that it's necessarily a slam dunk for choice, but they see themselves as having a better company to some extent, you know, at least from a margin perspective, from a global reach. Uh, they definitely have different brands. Um, you know, choice, choice is a little bit more concentrated in the U.S. And so for Choice's perspective, they're saying, okay, how do we grow globally? Well, Wyndham's a natural step. For, for Wyndham, they say, well, we don't really see that as, as, as much of an attractive situation for us, just to be the biggest in the U.S. and then also have some international presence, not really as compelling. What could be the potential regulatory issues that would be required for a potential combination like this? Sure. And, and Brian Egger and Jen Rhee actually wrote something on antitrust a few months ago, which is a fantastic piece, basically talking about the fact that you know, the deal might not go through from that standpoint. Choice has made comments that they've been talking with the FTC and, and sort of trying to put that to rest saying, hey, listen, this could get blessed by the antitrust regulator gods. But I think the the key concern here is when you deal with hotels, if you have a consolidation of hotels, it certainly could potentially affect the consumer, right? The end consumer has less choice in the matter, no pun intended. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> just give us a what would this balance sheet look like um, if you were to kind of merge these two companies? Because um, I'm just looking at it now. It looks like they're kind of three, three and a half times mm -hmm. net debt to EBITDA today. But what would it look like pro forma? And is that a problem? Sure. So, you know, we, we did a calculation a few weeks ago. We were talking about choice, just the inevitable potential that they could fall to high yield. And one of the things we looked at is is from a leverage standpoint, if you look at Bloomberg's MODL screen, so if you look at what consensus estimates are for 2024, 25, 
On the high end, we have over six times, low end, mid five times, both of which are above what the readers have as, as their, you know, their, their threshold into high yield. And so that's, you know, if, if we assume that four time, that four billion dollars of, of debt that they could take on, that could easily get them there. That would take quite a few years to repay. And I don't know if the regulators would be as, or sorry, the the raiders would be as accepting of their story as they were with with Hyatt when Hyatt did the Apple Leisure acquisition. How would this merger better position the potentially combined company to better compete with other larger lodging rivals, including Marriott as well as Hilton? That is a great question, Jess. So I think really at the end of the day, when you think about what's going on in this mid-tier, low-tier, Marriott and Hilton are really expanding in big ways, both internationally as well as domestically. And they have been really just taking on 300, 400 new locations easily over the next year or so and these brand new businesses that they have. And so they are they are blanketing the space and trying to really aggressively enter it. On the flip side, Choice has been entering the upscale. And so we have been seeing that a little bit, mid-tier upscale. You know, they bought Radisson Americas. That was a big win for them in terms of that. But I think the industry as a whole is definitely getting a bit more competitive, particularly as we get to this post-COVID time and consumers' preferences has changed, right? Consumers are looking at Airbnbs, but they're looking at these uh, ability to be able to live in a more comfortable environment, have a kitchen if they want to, um, have a little bit more affordability in terms of what they're doing. So I think we're seeing this amalgamation of businesses across the board. No one's going to stay in that upper tier only. They're going to try to span the whole entire economic scale. So stepping back, I mean, I just booked a trip for Ireland in September Ooh. of next year, yeah. and there's only one slot left. I mean, it is out of control. So what, generally speaking, we're going back to the homeland to see, to see, to see the peeps. <laughs> Love um, that. Yeah, they're, they're psyched, I'm sure. Um, talk to us about the hotel <laughs> business in general here. Where, where are we now in kind of the recovery? So, Paul, I mean, I think for hotels, so first of all, you bring up a good point that people are definitely international traveling much more this year into next year than they were last year, right? People feel much more comfortable getting on the road, going internationally, and are doing so significantly while they can get, you know, do it while you can and while you're living and healthy. So that said, I mean, I think for hotels, a lot of them were affected very quickly by the pandemic, but recovered pretty quickly by the pandemic. Case in point, Marriott, Hilton, uh, Hyatt, they all levered up with their revolvers and then quickly paid them back. Now, Hilton has stayed high yield rated because they haven't really made the commitment to want to be investment grade, but Hyatt and Marriott have gotten multiple notches of upgrade and have been in a much better spot. That said, there is some concern for the overall industry, particularly in the U.S., about financing. So these hotel companies are, you know, they're just brands. They're managing these businesses, right? Most of them are so asset light. I mean, Choice is 100% asset light, but but Marriott and Hilton and Hyatt have moved that way and are about 90 or so, um, at, you know, in terms of assets that they don't own but manage. That said, they are all sort of looking at ways to sort of grow their businesses, think about their businesses, and think about their balance sheets at the same time, but also trying to help out the the hotel owners, meaning those, you know, a mom and pop or a REIT who owns a hotel decides to go with Marriott, Marriott then manages it. They have to get financing. They do it from local banks and credit unions. And so earlier this year, we definitely saw a little bit of a concern related to them getting financing. That is certainly eased, but it's it's in the back of people's minds. Talk to us about how much the extended stay in economy lodging competition has heated up. Yeah, so extended stay in economy lodging, certainly areas of growth these days, uh, maybe less so as we head into next year, the following year, but there is that narrative around the infrastructure bill and the fact that we'll have so many people working on projects and using these extended stays as that option. There's different types of extended stays. There's the one that are 10 days or more. And then there's the ones that are more shorter term extended stays. A lot of people like to lump them in together. Choice and Wyndham like to talk about how their extended stay is different than what Marriott and Hilton are building. But I think it's a matter of time before you have these larger companies sort of looking into those areas. 
Jody, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, always appreciate getting your thoughts there. Jody Lurie, she's a credit analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence covering the lodging space, amongst others. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. We all learned a new term, which is supply chain yes. and how fragile the global supply chain is. And we had no idea what right. was going on. Thankfully, uh, we started talking to somebody who really does. <laughs> and he was very, very good to us during the whole pandemic uh, giving us kind of uh, a real explanation of what's going on in the global supply chain. That person is Gene Soroka. He's the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles. He joins us live here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. Port of Los Angeles, the busiest container port in North America. Uh, so absolutely right on the front lines. Gene, thanks so much for joining us here. It seems like, well, let me ask you, are we back to quote unquote normal in terms of that global supply chain? Yeah, happy holidays, Jess and Paul. Great to be back in New York. I, generally speaking, yes. All the vital statistics in Los Angeles, just use that as a yep. barometer of the nation's supply chain, look great. Cargo is flowing smoothly, and there is capacity available as the market picks up, which we project it will again in 2024. Overall, global trade is down about 5%. Here in the U.S., imports are down about 18%. So really? some of the entanglements we witnessed during the pandemic have been worked out, a lot of thought went into it, but also eased by that lower volume. Gives us a chance to kind of catch our breath and fix some of the things that needed work. What does holiday shipping look like right now? And what does that tell us about the direction of the economy? Yeah, compared to years past, Jess, even in recent memory, inventory levels across the nation look good. In-store fulfillment, fulfillment centers themselves also look good as far as getting the products that we want when we order them or go to the store. At the Port of Los Angeles, we've seen four consecutive months of year-on-year -year gains. Steady improvement, trying to fuel that U.S. economy. And what we hear from the retailers, we had a good Thanksgiving weekend from uh, Black Friday through Cyber Monday, about an 8% uptick. And those experts are calling for about a 3 to 4% gain in overall holiday sales when everything is said and done. So we here on Global Wall Street have been hearing about a recession for 18 months that hasn't really shown up. What do you see in your data? What do your customers tell you? Well, we don't. And if you keep talking about it, you could probably talk yourself into it, right. as you both have seen for a long time. But by technical standards, and in the definition, we had a recession last year, Q1 and Q2, with GDP declines in, the, in that first and second quarter. Since then, the numbers are all over the board, unlike what we've witnessed in recent memory, but the jobs report, easing inflation. We think that interest rates have peaked now, and with 8.7 million jobs open around the country, although off their highs, still a lot for that U.S. economy to fuel in servicing those of us who are buying and going out for experiential uh, plans with our yep. family and friends. What lingering issues still haven't been resolved yet from COVID when it does come to those supply chains? The interconnectivity, the, the dependencies that we all have on each other. In, in our business, Jess, there are about 12 nodes in the supply chain that have an impact of what we do at the ports, yet we're so visible. So drawing people together for better collaboration, absolutely key. We cannot work in silos. Second, this information sharing concept that we pioneered almost a decade ago has to become mainstream. And if you're going to share information to make sure that those handoffs are succinct, you've got to protect that data through cybersecurity and resiliency. All right, Map Go, which was just critical during the pandemic when we were talking about the supply chain. You can uh, you know, filter it to see the ships at port all around the world, including Los Angeles and Long Beach. You guys look pretty good there. I mean, it's a wholly different story than what it was uh, you know, at the peak of the supply chain issue. Um, talk to us about like when stuff gets on the gr gets into your port, I kind of forgot, you, you explained it to us before, it's got to get loaded, unloaded, put on a transport. How is that whole supply chain working? Getting stuff, once it's off one of those big ships, out to America. Yeah, better, Paul, but still a lot of work to do. And, and if you've seen one port, you've seen one port. We're a gateway. We unload that entire vessel when it comes in, load it back up to head to Asia. Our productivity at 12,000 container units loaded on and off a vessel at Los Angeles 
It's the best in the business today. But that cargo has to move off that terminal tarmac. And with the benefit of history, that's what slowed us down the most during COVID. Cargo was sitting at the port. Some used it as a warehouse because they were buying their goods just in case not necessarily just in time. But all the vitals today look great. If we can get that cargo off the port property in two to four days by rail and truck, then you're really starting to see the capacity gains that we all look for. When it comes to inflation, everyone talks about obviously goods versus services. Do you have a gauge whenever it comes to shipping to tell us what exactly that looks like when it comes to the difference between those two and how that obviously impacts inflation? Yeah, big topic today, Jess, supply versus demand and capacity. Right now, we've got the liner shipping companies who are based in Asia and Europe bringing in new capacity, larger ships, more fuel efficient, more clean for the environment. And those purchases were made with a cycle time of about three and a half, four years. We're starting to see that tonnage come in as global trade has moderated and in some cases declined. So you've got excess capacity, lower demand. Prices are in the favor of the American importer and exporter this coming year. So Gene, you guys at at, at your port have a great view on China. So much of that trade comes into your port from China. It's a direct route. What's your view of what are you seeing from China and the activity coming out of China in terms of trade? Yeah, on the business side, many of the uh, folks that we deal with are talking about a China plus one strategy, not putting all your eggs in one basket. The geopolitical issues scare a lot of people, make them nervous, but also just good business practice says, I got to be able to move my sourcing out a little bit. Similar to when I lived in China during SARS. 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. a lot of the same discussion. So we are seeing growth in Southeast and South Asia. The Port of Los Angeles year end 2022, about 57% of all of its cargo emanated from or was destined to China. We'll close this year at about 53% of our business with China. So it's moved down a little bit, but has not fallen off a cliff like some had, had imagined. What about Europe? Europe, very small percentage. Our theater is the Trans-Pacific. Second market is the west coast of South America with respect to perishable fruits and vegetables. That's really our strong point. About three to 4% of all the products that we move in and out emanate from Europe. More natural trade lane is across the Atlantic to the east coast and Gulf Coast ports of the US. So when the west coast ports were having some challenges with productivity, I remember you coming in here saying, some shippers were even going to take the extra cost and maybe go through the Panama Canal and go to the eastern ports like, you know, Savannah or New York or whatever, New Orleans. A, have you got that business back? Because I, we were just mentioning off air, I just saw a photo of a gazillion ships trying to get in and out of the Panama Canal because it's low water level. So that's not an option anymore, is it really? No, issues are popping up left and right. And now we're just a little more attuned to them in the supply chain with so many eyes on the system. We completed a 13 month contract negotiation with our dock workers back in the summertime. Since that contract was ratified, we've seen about four and a half to five points of market share come back to the West Coast of the US. There is good evidence from importers that they're moving a little bit more cargo via the West Coast because the transit uncertainty going through the canal with its low water levels right now is a little bit too much of a risk. Even though you can buy yourself up in the queue a little bit, yep. that doesn't apply to everybody going through there. And coming up, election year, a lot of folks will be looking at that policy and perspective. And the dock workers on the East and Gulf Coast will be negotiating their contract coming up ah. this summertime. How so a lot to keep in view. Right, especially when it comes to those contract negotiations. Do you see any sort of sticking points that could cause any sort of concerns and potentially what that could affect when it comes to obviously the port and what that means for shipping? Well, across America, we saw a summer of discontent, Jess, and a lot of final negotiations and contracting in the favor of labor and the employee. I don't see that any different on the East Coast. It's folks that work through the pandemic day and night, fearless of health and safety issues, trying to keep the American economy moving, and their payday is due. Yep. 30 seconds. What brings you to New York other than New York? (laughs) A couple of industry events. Wanted to talk with you all and kind of give you a layout here of what we're looking like towards the end of the year, the holiday season. And I'm optimistic about 2024. We've got a relatively early Lunar New Year, February 10th. And I see the calendar of supply chain falling a little bit more normally next year with an uptick in cargo through the port of L.A. 
Gene Soroka, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you coming in today and during really the last several years when everybody was trying to get a handle on what the supply chain issues, what the issues were uh, and how they were going to play out. Gene Soroka, Executive Director, Port of Los Angeles. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 11. So, Jess, when I bought the Jersey Shore compound earlier this year, my mortgage, mortgage rate 6%, I felt like a knucklehead. <laughs> but now they got to over 8%. It's looking a little pr- pretty good now. Yeah, I'm like, a, I'm a real estate <laughs> mogul. Uh, they're back down to 7.32%. That's the, uh, the bankrate.com 30 year uh, fix. So, uh, trending down a little bit better. But I don't know what's happening out there because nothing's moving out there because nobody's going to get out of their 3% mortgage and go take on a 7.3% mortgage. Let's talk to somebody who does this stuff for a living, a professional. Corey Sassauer, principal broker at Compass, joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Suspicious last name. I'm just going to assume there's no relation. Hope for the best. <laughs> no relation. Hope for the best that she doesn't talk, you know, uh, emerging markets. Corey, so there's just nobody's selling their house. I mean, what do you say to us, somebody that you're trying to get drum up some business here? Because they're sitting on a mortgage that's three or four percent. And if they go anywhere, they're going to have to pay so much more. How does that how's that market playing out? Absolutely. So a lot of those guys are going into rentals and that's kind of what they're doing. There's a lot of rentals out there. The rental prices have definitely come down because more people are developing rentals. So what we're doing is we're going into listing presentations and we're talking to them and they're worried that their house is at its height right now, that the most money they're going to get is right now. They're afraid that it's going to get less. Do you think that's that's a fair way to think about it? I think in the next few years, I don't think right away, we okay. are in a massive underbuilding situation. There's not enough homes for the people that need it. So I think it depends on your location. Real estate, if I've learned anything in my many years <laughs> in it, is super hyper local. Yep. So every market is different. You know, I'm really speaking more tri-state area, but we say, all right, they're ready to go. They can't do the stairs anymore, or they kind of want to yep. get out. They want to make their money somewhere else. So we're putting them into rentals while they figure out what the right lifestyle is. Are they going to right size? Do they want to different house they want to go near their kids do they want to go somewhere warmer do they want to go somewhere where the tax rates are more favorable so they need to kind of figure out their life and a rental is the best option for them to do that and you know they'll do six month rentals a year rental and they have a good idea after a year where they really Mm -hmm. want to go Talk to us more about the low inventory that you were alluding to, Mm -hmm. because that was an issue well before the pandemic coming out of the great financial crisis, but obviously was exacerbated by the pandemic. What kind of regions have more issues when it comes to low inventory, or is it more broad based around the country where it's a problem? Yeah, so I don't think it's broad based. I think there are some areas that inventory, I think in the tri-state area, um, our inventory is really, really tight. Um, We sold 25% less as a county, and that's not because because the demand up in was Westchester lower, County. up in Westchester. Okay. Um, and that's not because the demand was lower, it's really because there wasn't enough um, houses to go around. Yep. So there was bidding wars everywhere. The prices have definitely gone up and they've maintained that. Um, prices that are, pri- homes that are priced right are going way above asking, hundreds of thousands over really? asking. Still. If they're overpriced, they're sitting. People do not overprice your house. Price it right, you will get a bidding war. It happens every time, but if it's wow. overpriced, it sits. So it's still happening. Contingencies in our area are still being waived. People are very used to the no mortgage contingency anymore. Really? And appraisal contingencies are going away because now we have two years of strong data of home sales that are higher priced. Yep. In the beginning of the pandemic, it was harder. Homes weren't appraising That's because a, yeah, yeah, because you know we didn't have any data. It was so much lower than it was six months ago. Now um, houses are really appraising, so people are willing to waive those contingencies. I'm telling my guys, get in now. When the rates start going down, there's going to be even more demand, and you can refinance um, as time goes on. A lot of the lenders are now offering one free refinance within the year that you lock into a rate. So if rates do go down a half a point, you can refinance without all the extra costs. So is there a rate, I mean, when you sit around with your real estate buddies talking about the biz, is there a rate on the mortgage that you think will magically cause sellers to say, okay, now I'll put my house on the market if it's, I don't know if that rate, again, we're still north of 7% on the 30 year fix. Is that 6%? Is that 5%? Where right, that, like what's some the catalyst? Rate. Yeah, right. that kind of- Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's like five and a half. Okay. I think that's kind of the magic number. Um, the seven year arms are at six, 
percent now or even a little bit lower. You okay. can get it if you can put money into a bank. You know, they give you like a favorable discount. So there are there's a lot of lenders out there. There's a lot of people. It's a very competitive marketplace right now. You can definitely get a better rate than what you're hearing on like the national average. And it's very okay. county based. So some counties have lower rates than others. Um, but I think five and a half is like the right number where you're going to see kind of the floodgates open up. But people still have to move. People are getting yep. married. People's homes are, you know, families are expanding. People have job changes. So there is still always going to be an influx and flow. But my advice would always be to get like in before Westchester that. Like Westchester County, it's such a a great place to live. It always has been a great place to live um, in the metro New York area. Did you see a meaningful, during a pandemic, I'm just going down to Florida, I'm mm -hmm. done. I'm, I'm done with Westchester, I'm done with Connecticut. Yeah, Did absolutely. Anybody whose jobs who can take them where they didn't have to be in the office, where they had more flexibility, people were going for a better quality of life, warmer weather, lower you know, taxes. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people, everybody was going down to Florida. We've had a ton of people come back though. The real world has set in, you know, New York is where it's at, yeah. sorry. That's what, what <laughs> yep. I was curious about is how have yeah. things shifted then from when a lot you were of people broken and a lot the of peak of the COVID to now. Yeah, a lot of people have come back in our area and a lot of people kind of made poor pandemic choices and now they're kind of fixing that. So they're changing. They're not necessarily happy. They were going wherever they could get a house. One thing I'm curious about, because Paul brings this up, about in office, how much has that changed when people are coming back who may mm -hmm. have left, who were called back to come in? In yeah, office. it definitely changes a lot and it changes how north people are willing to go. So, you know, we had people that would be willing to commute an hour, an hour and 45 minutes. Um, now they want to go back to the towns that are maybe 30 minutes on the train. Uh, so those, I think there's actually, if I had a higher priced home in the more northern towns, I would be more concerned about my value than I would if I was in a more southern mm -hmm. town, given the fact that most companies are making people come in four days a week. That sounds like a more normalized metro New York kind of market. It is. Exactly. All right. So, um, but again, you're up there in Westchester. One of the it's always been in great demand here. Um, you know, if I put a house on the market reasonably priced, how fast will it sell? Do you think within a week? Really? Yeah. Wow. We'll put it on the market. You know, we'll do a coming soon on a Monday. We'll make it live on Thursday. We just did this last week. We had 30 offers. It went 250 over ask, no contingencies, and it went to contract within 24 hours. Who's buying these things? Offer. All it depends on the price point, right? So right. I think it's first time home buyers, it's people trying to look to move up because they kind of grew out of their house or they're maybe in an area that they, you know, want to be in a different area, better commutable area. Um, I think the drive the first time home buyers are the drivers of the buying market and then the sellers are the downsizers, or we call them right sizers. You know, they're not necessarily downsizing their house, they're just going to a house that makes more sense for their current lifestyle. So if you're a potential buyer, and we only have about 30 seconds left, what do you think are the top things they really need to be aware of right now? They need to get a pre-approval. If they can get it underwritten, I think that would be amazing so they know exactly how much they can spend, and they should go see every house that's out there because they may not know what they like until they see enough things. They need to be ready to rock when it's time. That sounds like a seasoned real estate person. Right. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, I sold my uh, the Summit place right at the beginning of the pandemic, and the salesperson, the industry, Uh huh didn't really have a firm grip on where the market was. Right. So I took their number, I put 20% on top of it, and I still got out, still really? came in over the top of that. Oof, uh, it was crazy. Period. Now I think there's a lot of comps and people have a better sense of what's yeah. going on. Corey Sassauer, principal broker, Compass, uh, up there in Westchester talking about a market. It's still uh, very robust out there, and I can tell you uh, same thing in Jersey. Uh, so again, good time to sell. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Brad Case joins us as uh, Chief Economist and Director of Research at Middleburg Communities. Joins us here in our uh, Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Brad, you were just saying off air that you guys in Middleburg communities have sold most of your communities, most of your assets, most of your uh, inventory. T tell us about that decision. Yeah, we're very active developers of rental housing communities, and we've and we've been in that situation. You know, we we've been around doing that for 17 years, something like that. But 2021 and early 2022 was kind of a golden moment to be selling assets. So we sold wow. literally everything we owned. And we are still actively developing. Um, we've got about a dozen under construction at the moment, but uh, or at least I, I think under construction. But uh, but yeah, we we sold at the top of the market. That was nice. That was I mean, 
I thought I sold at the top. Of the right. But that is, I mean, that's unusual, isn't no, it? No, and, and honestly, it is a little bit unusual because developers love their buildings. And a lot of them just don't want to sell, even yeah. if the prices are great. So one of the things that I really like about this company is that they're in it to make money. They're not in it to show off their trophies. So what's the typical community for Middleburg communities? What's the typical type of development? So we call them middle market class A. They're not luxury, they're not high rise, they're not like located on the beach. Um, they are in sort of suburban areas of major cities in the southeastern part of the country. It'll be like uh, eight buildings um, with 250 uh, rental housing units and some of them are multifamily, some of them are single family you know, build to rent where it's not scattered site, you're not owning a house, you're, you, you, you are renting a house within a community with the same sorts of amenities. You had a piece that you sent to us talking about how if you look back over the past 50 years of data that you were crunching, renting is usually better investment than when it comes to buying, but isn't there an investment case when it comes to buying? Oh, absolutely, there is. Um, but people tend to forget that if you buy, you are taking a big chunk of money and paying it to some money for a down payment. And that's money that you could otherwise be investing in, real, in, in the stock market. And so when you rent, you don't have to give up that big pile of money in the, market, in, in the beginning. So you can rent a place and take that big down payment and instead put it in the stock market. And typically, you've been better off, historically speaking. And so people have to understand that when they are making the decision to buy or to rent, it's not just that. It's, is there a, another good use for this money? You know, right now, for example, um, the only thing that makes uh, buying look good is that the stock market is so overvalued. Um, if the stock market, uh, you know, were were uh, more fairly valued, then you'd really want to rent because you wouldn't want to be giving up that money that you could be putting into stocks. All right, so let's talk about your call on the economy here. Um, we're we're going to hear from the Fed tomorrow. Uh, inflation is trending down. I don't see a uh, recession. What am I missing? So I, I think there's, a, there, there's not a very strong probability of a recession. And this is something I've been saying for two years, and a lot of, a lot of people have been calling recession. And right. there just simply hasn't been data suggesting a recession. What we had last month, though, is one of the most important variables, which is housing construction. Um, has really been on a downward trend. And historically speaking, that's one of the things that does tend to predict a, a recession. So just over the last uh, few days, I've updated my recession forecasting model and the probability that a recession will start in the next year went up from about 33% to 47%. Okay. Looking at your bio, you used to be working on the Federal Reserve Board as an economist. Can you walk us through typically when there's a two-day meeting at the Federal Reserve, how that process goes on in the presentations that go forward as far as trying to gauge the economy. Since this is the meeting, we'll get the quarterly updates for the economy as well as the dot plots. Yeah, you have to you have to know that, that at the Fed, there are something like 250 PhD economists. Um, and at the various other Federal Reserve banks around the country, they also have economists on staff. And they're trying to look at all parts of the economy. I remember once when I was in a, in a meeting, and Alan Greenspan was the chair of the Fed at that time, and he and there was Brief something case indicator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was something that had happened with beef prices, and he said, "You know, who can tell me why beef prices have have been doing this?" Mm. And an economist, a PhD economist, stood up and said, "I am the specialist on beef herds." It's wow. just it just blows your mind to to understand. It's not like 250 people are forming their opinion about the overall economy. Mm -hmm they're forming their opinion about one tiny piece of it and feeding it to the decision makers. So it really is an extraordinarily, extraordinary amount of data and expertise sort of helping them understand what are the stakes in the decisions they're making. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the economists are telling Fed Chairman Powell as he gets ready for his meeting? Well, there, there are real risks in the economy. One of the most important is the housing market. You know, the Dallas Fed, for example, produces what they call an exuberance indicator. And that shows whether the housing market seems to be in a bubble. And yeah, it's flashing red, or the last few months it's been flashing, the last few quarters, it's been flashing red or yellow every quarter. Um, so that is, that is a risk that they look at. Because um, we just had a, a real estate agent here and she covers Westchester County, Scarsdale, some very, very good areas. And she said it is still 
crazy bidding wars. Absolutely. For, and, that's, for and, and that's what was happening back in 2005, 2006, before the big mortgage market meltdown. So one of, the, one of the real risks is that house prices start going down again. I don't think it would be anything like what we saw in 2007 to 2009, because we haven't had uh, the, kind of, the kind of idiocy that mm -hmm. we had back then. Um, but that is one of the risks to the economy. How challenging is it coming out of the pandemic when there's really not a lot of historical precedence to give this? Because it seems like everybody's gotten it wrong as as far as their calls to be in a recession over the past 18 months, Paul and I have talked so much about and people have been so wrong about it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, one of the things that you have to keep in mind when things are disrupted is that the data that the Fed members are using to keep track of the economy, that gets disrupted too. That's in fact one of the things that, you know, if, if the federal government goes into a shutdown, like, like, like there is some concern that they may do early, early next year, that's one of the things that gets affected by a shutdown. So the pandemic really disrupted the flow of data that the Fed um, uses to make decisions, but also that people like my company use to make that kind of decision too. So there's an ECFC function in the terminal that is the consensus for economists that are pulled by Bloomberg. There's still a 50% chance when you're looking at this of a probability of a recession, which seems relatively high compared to estimates, say, at Goldman Sachs economists and some other firms on Wall Street. What is the catalyst that is making people so pessimistic? Because when you're looking at consumer spending numbers, it's obviously more than two thirds of what's powering the economy, still very strong and yeah. resilient. Look, the most important piece of the economy is the labor markets, and they have continued to be strong and resilient. And, um, and, and that drives income growth, that drives consumption growth. So, so you're right. Those are the most important things, and they're very healthy. As I said, sort of the weakest thing that I'm seeing right now is the construction numbers, the housing construction numbers, both single family, but especially over the last few months, multifamily, and that's nationwide. And, that's, and part of that is because um, interest rates have gone up, but honestly, the bigger problem is that for years interest rates were so low that any idiot could get into the <laughs> housing construction business and plenty of them did. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so if we go into a recession over the next year, it seems to me the most likely reason is that there were too many, thing, too many houses built by those idiots back in those days. Um, and, and that weakens the entire economy. So actually, you don't want to be in a situation where, uh, where interest rates are especially low. You want to be in a situation where it's hard to figure out, like it's hard to make a project work. Um, because in that case, the idiots are out of the market. The only people who make the projects work are the people who can do it well and can do it even when the economy turns south. So just about 30 seconds, you guys are constructing some properties now, but you're financing at higher rates, right? Absolutely. So it's, it, 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 it's, it, we're, we're financing at higher rates, and the bigger, biggest problem is it's just more difficult to get the financing. So we have mm. to work harder. That's the way it should be. Yep. It shouldn't be easy for us to get financing. Um, but but you know, one of our really good projects, for example, is in a secondary market, and some of the financing sources to say, we want to be only in the biggest cities yep. now. Yep, interesting. Brad Case, thanks so much for joining us. Brad Case, he's the Chief Economist and Director of Research at Middleburg Communities, and it's just a fascinating story. They were sellers in you know, 20, 21, 22, <laughs> as was I. I thought I was the only smart person out there, but again, a good move there. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.